All right. Well, welcome to Glider Ground School for the Private Pilot. Um, my name is Mark Stanfield. I, um, this is me down in uh, on the right side there in uh, Arizona at Arizona Soaring and in, uh, in Estrella uh, uh, Air Park. And um, last April, I got my uh, glider instructor add-on. And um, prior to that, I had my CFI for three years. Um, I'm a pharmacist by day. Um, I work in an oncology clinic, um, so a uh, very special population, very emotionally challenge, uh, challenging for me at times. Um, so flying is a great outlet. Um, I am a commercial pilot, um, and I fly for WAM uh, out here in Hood River, Oregon. Um, and uh, I started with in soaring. Uh, or gliding, um, there's not a soaring license, so it's interesting, right? It's a glider license that you'll be getting. Um, I started in soaring as a, a tow pilot, became chief tow pilot for Hood River Soaring, and then we needed, we were kind of needed instructors, and so I uh, decided to get my instructor add-on, and I've really enjoyed um, this past year uh, instructing, and uh, the 12 students that I had this summer have, um, are really, you know, starting to help shape me into an instructor too. Um, so I'm learning a whole bunch. Um, and uh, yeah, we soloed five of them at the end of the year. So that wasn't too bad for first season. Um, there's my email address. You can always email me. Um, I'm great about getting back on email. Texting is the next best option. Um, and these will be on your uh, emails I send to you. And then if, if something like we really need to talk over the phone, we'll, we'll make a, a time for a call. But otherwise, I'm really horrible about just answering the phone because a lot of times I'm with patients in the clinics and I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old and a wife and an aviation habit. So so I'm busy like you guys. Um, and then our hoodriversoaring.org uh, email. Um, oops, okay. Okay, so here we are at the Wildwood Academy. Just a quick couple notes. Um, I showed you where the restrooms are. Feel free to get up and use them since um, this will be recorded. You'll be able to go back later, listen to it. They, let's, you know, just like a, any good airplane, we want to leave this place as good as uh, good as better. Or we found it, so um, we'll pick up after ourselves and um, and treat the place with respect. It's really quite beautiful, I think. Um, I want to thank the Soaring Society of America um, for uh, letting us use this, this the uh, webinar software, which is to your benefit, um, like especially you, Chuck, if it's bad out and you can't get in, um, this will be live and you can get on it. Um, and that's for anybody if you're up in Parkdale or whatever, or if it's just really bad and no, nobody can get out, you know, like we had here a few, six or seven years ago. I'll just do it from home and we'll still continue the class. Um, and you'll be able to go back and listen to it. Um, and then, of course, Hood River Soaring, our home soaring club. And there's our artistic poster for our club. Um, objectives. There's really two main objectives here is to help you pass the FAA written exam. And there's an example, uh, which we'll see some more of, of what it's, it's an electronic test. And, um, and then the second part of the objective is help pass you the oral portion of the FAA check ride. Um, this, the bottom lower right picture is me with Mike Bamberg. Mike Bamberg is a, a local, what you call DPE, um, designated pilot examiner. Um, this is the person when you go to take your check ride that will come out and he'll do, he'll spend about four hours with you that day, about two and a half hours of asking you a whole bunch of questions and then going flying with you and make, and making sure that you're a safe pilot. Um, Mike's a friendly guy. He looks friendly, right? And uh, he's very knowledgeable. At, at the end, he always says, when you have questions, call 1-800-ASK-MIKE. And literally, I can call him all the time. And I do often. <laughs> um, so, and basically, just moving forward, um, when you're thinking about learning this information, especially for the check ride, we basically want to get at this level the, the most simple part of the concept. Let's keep it simple. We're going to 
answer the questions that's what's being asked because when they want to know more about a certain subject they're going to start asking you about it okay so as we kind of go through uh, the material keep these in mind um, the success of these uh, objectives obviously depends on you um, I'm here to guide you through the mountains and mountains of material this like tonight's lecture we're going over certificate certificates and documents and this is like as a pilot you also kind of have to be a bit of an attorney so tonight we're going to talk about uh, some people might find the most boring part I find some of it kind of exciting um, so this is kind of the hardest lecture the first one and because uh, there's going to be some some slides with a lot of legal ease that we'll be looking at but I'm really going to kind of show you how to like look at it and just like what are they really trying to get to here what's the most important thing for where you're at um, so don't be scared uh, obviously knowledge starts with an awareness of the subject um, um, however you guys have to do the reading you have to manage your time to study you actually have to go take the exams and so you can make your dreams a reality um, by doing all the hard work um, there's already a lot of successful people in this room I know that can attest to that this is a picture of the Perlin uh, anybody follow the Perlin too which is the uh, Perlin 2 is the help me out um, pressurized glider that they're trying to make it into suborbital space check it out online uh, they fly down in Argentina from the months of July to September um, because there's some amazing lift phenomena there which we'll talk about in our weather section um, very cool project which was a first tested down in Redmond and I think mostly built down in Redmond all right so let's get started there's a Pawnee tow plane pulling two gliders at once you don't see that often um, okay so two main uh, webs websites uh, hoodriversoaring.org which I'm gonna have to show you some tabs later on there that'll a lot of email address or a lot of web addresses I talk about you'll be able to go there as a resource page so there's a resource page that we're that we're building and then the SSA which is Soaring Society of America um, so their page has lots and lots of great information and then of course you can you can always Google uh, use Google to find great information it's Google that beep <laughs> that's the uh, I was glad somebody asked and uh, I was seeing if you were paying attention uh, one of my pharmacists used that with me at work he's like just go GTS that and I'm like what's that and he's like go Google that beep and I'm like oh okay great so um, all right so okay so what drives all this for an examiner um, I, I sent this out on the email this is the PTS um, it comes in a F, the examiner comes out it's in a little booklet like this it's called the private test standards you can download it for free almost everything in the FAA um, that's required to learn how to fly you can download for free this when I talked to Mike Bamberg our local DPE your pilot examiner he says this is the Bible so he says drive everything off of this so that's what I how I've designed the class and um, the areas in red are the areas this class are going to hit the areas in black are what you're going to learn with uh, either the soaring club if you soar with us or a flight instructor somewhere else okay so tonight the areas of operation inside this booklet it shows an examiner you know what they have to ask you and what forms they need when they show up blah 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 and we'll, we'll talk about that but like I said areas of operations within the PTS start the um, the test and off of that we're starting with section a certificates and documents okay so you can print these out for free um, you can take notes along on it if you have it okay so I've actually gone into it and blown up that section area of operation um, and really so some of you have gotten a private pilot have your private pilot license here so you've done the PTS um, you can go on and get instrument license for power you can get commercial license for power you can get commercial license for 
uh, glider instructor uh, or glider you know that's how I entered into the glider world was with my commercial and all of these PTS um, documents are moving to a new form called the ACS and the only reason I bring this up is that eventually the glider may change so if it changes in this process you know that's coming and the only changes they're going to change kind of the the uh oh let me use the let me use the uh they were showing me this fancy spotlight they're going to change this section to look like a section that because is called no consider and do so I'm going to kind of guide you through this section in case they ever change that or in case any of you ever go on to do power stuff, you're going to start to understand the no, consider, do. And really, um, they're looking at it as what do we need to know about this particular subject? So the examiner is going to look at this stuff and say, for these certificates, what do you need to know? What do you need to consider? What are the risks of dealing with anything? Because flying could be... It comes with an element of risk, right? And then be able to do it. This particular lecture today is mostly going to be dealing with knowledge and maybe considering some risk. There's not, well, there are some do as far as logging some things, but writing down, you know, your time in a log or in, a, in your log or something doesn't come with a whole bunch of risk. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. So, all right, whoops. Okay, so all of, for the certificates and documents, a lot of the stuff gonna, we're gonna talk about tonight comes out of the Code of Federal Regulations, which is chapter 14, Aeronautics and Space. Um, we call them the FARS, the Federal Aviation Regulations. It's totally free on the, um, on the website under the Code of Federal Regu Regulations. You can also buy it in an ASA book like this, comes out each year, um, but the, the Code of Federal Regulations is searchable, which is really nice, right? And it's free. Um, some guys, if you still like paper, here it is. Um, and the three sections we're gonna be working on tonight are part 43, which deals with the maintenance and uh, prevent it, Preventative maintenance, part 61, cert certification or your anything dealing with your actual license. And a little bit about part 91 tonight, which is general operating rules. But for you as private glider pilots, you're mostly dealing with in the area of 61 and 91. So this is just a little breakdown of the laws. Okay. The second part of that book is called the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual. Um, we don't get too much into the AIM tonight. Um, you'll, we'll use the AIM section in some of our other lectures, um, but it's basically uh, guidance documents. Some of it, it's really like, how are these laws kind of interpreted, right? And um, so it's free too, also to download uh, from the F. Uh, from the FAA, um, or you can buy it in the book, which it's in the back section of the book. And then um, the FAA has this, these long, you know, abbreviations for everything, codes for each book. Um, the, the, the two books I suggest you use, well, actually, you don't have to use both, one or the other, right, is the Glider Flying Handbook um, and the or the, and the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. We'll pull from both of those, but I'll tell you in your syllabus which days to read what. Um, those are both totally free to download as PDFs um, from the FAA. They're great. Um, and then the other two books I have on the right are glider uh, or books from Russell Holtz, which are similar books. He basically has rewritten everything that just make, boils it down more to what does the glider pilot need to know? So um, these other books by the FAA are, the Glider Flying Handbook by the FAA is geared for the glider, but it's still very wordy, okay? Um, but, but the, so either book is fine and I, I will try to let you know um, 
which chapters to read out of which section because our youth members in the soaring club actually use the books on the right when you go to fly the flight training manual by russell holtz is excellent um page turner okay so quick exam a uh, quick section here on the faa knowledge exam it's it's 60 questions that you have to go sit down like you go to a testing center basically you go to troutdale you sit down and you take uh the test you got 2.5 hours to take it you got to have a passing score of 70 percent you want to have a much bigger passing score on that because it prints out all the questions you got wrong and then the examiner on the day of the check ride will will really hammer hammer you depending on how well or you do or don't um so um you know if you have 100 they're gonna be like oh great okay we can skip that section right so um but from students that have gotten less than not scores of 90s i've heard they've had a little bit of a rough time in that um now the the these prep books the asa makes one um and they they have software that uh, you can download on your phone it's only like 10 bucks super user friendly trains you very well um, the book is just as user friendly it's i think it's a little bit more 11 bucks the the question uh bank is really deep and it really prepares you well for the the um exam um dauntless aviation also has a private pilot test software it's a little more expensive but there it's also a lot more thorough in its explanations um i like the asa because it was nine dollars and it goes right on my phone and i can just flip through them um the the faa provides 60 questions sample questions uh for free um it won't propel prepare you well um so um but again then before you go and take your faa knowledge exam um you would get an endorsement from your instructor so that could be me or another cfig that helped you go through a course like this to to, to take your written questions some people just don't like no like like what you know what's this written i got to take and everything it's really you just go down to the troutdale airport there's a testing center there and you sit down like your sat exams or anything like that okay so all right let's get started um into the real material here um so everything i like to when i first get a student i like to start with this uh acronym called pave um, the F when you sit down with an examiner, he's going to want to know you're thinking about how do you rate, manage your risk before you go flying every single day. This is an acronym I use. Um, this isn't something I invented. I think the FAA did. Um, they have several other models, but this is one of them. Um, but I always like to think of when I'm driving to the airport, I'm going to pave my way to success, right? And so you use these little checklists in your mind of um of is this going to be a safe flying day right so that's what they're really looking for for the for you as a as a pilot to think you know have i thought about everything and minimized all the risks that i can right and so um everything we do in this whole entire class i'm going to bring back to this one phrase so that you can stuff it in places and be like okay that's where i'm going to have to like kind of think about where that's at and remember it and we'll try to have little acronyms as we go along okay so um i really get excited when i think about pave and it just makes me think about okay what do i need to know for today and what kind of what kind of environment am i getting into when i'm flying um and so with pave we consider the pilot right you consider yourself are you safe that day are you prepared that day your aircraft is it safe that day is it you know the, the were the wings strapped on tight after you guys broke it broke it down from the last place you, you stored it or went soaring and put it back together is the environment got safe weather or safe landing places to fly in um external forces why am i doing this you know like i stayed up way too late last night watching tv and i'm not prepared whatever so um we'll talk more about that yes sir
Oh, I do. Okay. Thank you. See, these are the, I'll fix that later. That was see that I printed this paper out that for when people said to add things or fix things, there it is. So it's probably going to be in every single slide. All right. Blame that one on the three-year-old, right? No, Op error operator. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start with pilot certificate privileges and limitations. Um, so what can you do? What can you not do? What do you need to do it with, right? Um, one of the things we can do as a private pilot, obviously, is go fly our glider, go soaring in the, the beautiful Cascades here. And we can give rides to friends, which is... This is one of our glider pilots giving rides to friends. Um, and it's an it's amazing experience to do, right? So um, here's the first big legal mumbo jumbo, okay? So in your syllabus, I, I sent you all the FARs that you should become familiar with. There's no way you're gonna remember, memorize all this stuff. And the ones I'm gonna go through here are key ones to um, remember something about. So requirement for certificate ratings and authorizations okay a lot of these start with no person may serve as a as a required pilot flight crew member of a civil aircraft of the united states unless that person has in the person's physical possession or readily accessible in the aircraft when exercising the privileges of that pilot certificate or a pilot certificate issued under this part blah 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 and has a photo id and the photo id has got to be a driver's license issued by the state or a government id um, by the federal government u.s armed forces or official passport okay um, medical certificate is not required if you are exercising the privileges of a student pilot certificate while seeking a pilot certificate with a glider category rating okay um, and then skipping down to the last section, in inspection of certificate. So this is all about if an administrator, meaning somebody from the FAA, uh, somebody from any federal law or local law enforcement uh, department comes, that you got to show this certificate and that photo ID. Okay, and so what I've done here is boiled it down to what 61.3 requirement for certificates, ratings, and authorizations really sh says is you need to have a pilot FAA pilot certificate with you. You need to have a go government issued photo ID with you when you fly. You don't need a medical requirement as a me as a glider pilot. And if for some reason the sheriff shows up, you got to show it to them if they ask for it. Nope. Nope. Instructor doesn't. Commercial pilot doesn't. That's why I think that's why a lot of old guys switch into flying gliders at the end of their career because it's like uh, I lost my medical. I'm gonna go fly. Right. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. So the examiner. Did I skip something? No, nope, maybe not. Okay, nope. Got to trust my slides. The examiner, Mike, he may say, hey, what do you have to have on your person to be legal to fly? And you're going to say, uh-huh, perfect. And that's why that's why you students, some of you are students in here, when, when we're like, when we're getting close to that, I can smell the solo coming. I'm like, okay, let's get you, let's get your IACRA filled out. IACRA, I'll go over that later. That's how you get your... Your, your student pilot certificate. All right. And then he's going to follow up with, do you need a medical to fly this glider? And you're going to say, nope. Nope. They love to ask that question because some of these examiners are going to lose their medical someday too, right? So this is what it could look like on the test. What document must be in your personal possession or readily accessible in the aircraft while operating as pilot in command of an aircraft? And you're going to be looking for an appropriate pilot certificate and an appro 
and an appropriate current medical certificate if required. All the other all the other questions on there are incorrect. Okay, so I'll save you. Some of you may find this hard to read, but you can see this is the software, and what I would this is the what this is the regulatory section, and so what I would advise you to do as you're going studying this week is just cruise through this bank of questions, and if something doesn't make sense, highlight it, right? And, or screen, take a picture of the screen, send it to me and be like, hey, can we talk about this one, okay? So the rest of this class today is I'm really gonna be hitting the, the most important FARs and going through a sample of the question, okay? So this is the ASA software, right? And um, it's kind of like an advertisement for them, so hopefully they don't sue me for, you know, showing this, right? Um, so, um, so this is this particular part of learning to be a pilot is really just like the book work, sitting down and like banging out the the question banks and and getting to to, to know these FARs. It's the most kind of unpleasant part. Um, very simple one. I had this asked one time, but. 6160, change of address. The holder of a pilot, flight instructor, or ground instructor certificate who has made a change in permanent mailing address may not, after 30 days from that date, exercise the privileges of the certificate unless the holder has notified in writing that they changed their address, okay? So if you move, tell the FAA. A lot of us have professional license, you gotta do that. My pharmacy license, if I move, I gotta tell the, the board of, the State Board of Oregon, where I moved to. And here's the question. If a certified pilot changes permanent mailing address and fails to notify the FAA Airman cert Certification Branch of the new address, the pilot is entitled to exercise the privileges of the pilot certificate for a period of only 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. The answer is, all right, we're listening. Okay, cool. Okay. so. 61113, private pilot privileges and limitations. Pilot in command, okay? So let's read just these red parts here real quick. Except as provided in paragraphs B through H, it's always that kind of language, just read through it. No person who holds a private pilot certificate may act as a pilot in command of an aircraft that is carrying passengers or property for compensation or hire nor may that person for compensation or hire act as pilot in command of an aircraft. Okay, so what they're telling you here is as a private pilot, you cannot, if, you know, your buddy says, hey man, will you, you know, give me a ride in your glider, let me take my girlfriend up and I'll pay you, you know, and it's like, no, you can't do that. I can take you for free, you know, but we skip down a little further to see a private pilot may not pay less than the prorate a share of the operating expenses of the flight with passengers, provided the expenses only involve fuel, oil, airport expenditures, or rental fees, right? So Logan says, hey, Stan, will you, I'm, it's prom day. Will you take me and my prom date up on this cool glider ride and I'll pay for it? No, but we can split the cost between the two of us, right? Okay, pretty clear. Yes? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. So you can split, you know, like you can, you know, want to go up and soar the ridge for five hours and wear diapers so that you don't ex exceed the limit of your bladder, right? You can like both pay 25 bucks for the tow and the tow costs 50. So you each pay 25 bucks, get up on the ridge and soar all day long, right? Some guys have do it. Yes. That our this our class does not cover that. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Um, but there are examples where you can, right? So you 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 can read through this, and there will be a few questions on it. The next one I kind of highlighted because I know they asked the question: a private pilot may act as pilot in command of a charitable nonprofit or community flight. A, Community event flight described in 91146. Well, you got to skip to 91146. And there's all these things like, you know, the glider club could pay a private pilot to give a charity ride. And you got to notify the FAA in seven days to do beforehand to do all this stuff. Well, we have commercial pilots, so we're not going to pay our private pilots to do it. Right. And skip all the getting in any kind of trouble with 
pay on private pilots to do it. Um, you know, like line 200, a private pilot who is an aircraft salesman and who has at least 200 hours of logged flight time may demonstrate an aircraft in flight to a prospective buyer. So there's like a few limitations in there. But the one that the examiner or Mike's going to talk to you about is like, hey, I, I'm, you know, like the prom example, right? So, so read through this one, become familiar with this one. It's not too bad, but it's, it's one of the biggies. And here's the question. According to regulations pertaining to privileges and limitations, a private pilot may a be paid for the operating expenses of a flight if at least three takeoffs and three landings were made by a pilot within the preceding 90 days. And good thing people are laughing. Not be paid in any manner for the operating expenses of the flight. And good job. That's tricky. There, there's where they're trying to trick you, right? Not pay less than the pro rate a share of the operating expenses of flight with passengers, provided the expenses of all only fuel, oil, airport expenditures, or rental fees. Bing, 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 or winner, right? And then the cool thing about the software is it addresses down there at the bottom the reference, right? So, okay. Moving on, medical fitness. Um, oh, real quick back about that. There's, so the question banks, there will be three or four different questions about some of that stuff, and they may try to ask some of it different ways. Or So that's why it's good because it they sometimes can trick you or try to trick you. So medical fitness, we already operate uh, 6123, if they didn't already tell us enough, which but I love this, operations not requiring a medical certificate. A person is not required to hold a medical certificate when exercising the privileges of a student pilot certificate while seeking A pilot certificate with glider or balloon privileges or a pilot certificate with a glider category rating or balloon class rating and it goes on so um, again we've already kind of discussed that but it says it again so and here's the question prior to becoming certified as a private pilot with a glider riding rating the pilot must have in his or her possession what type of medical a, a statement from a designated medical examiner. B, a third class medical certificate. C, a medical certificate is not required. C, all right. Um, saves you a bit of money each year or, or every, you know, depending on which medical license you're going after. Okay, so even though we don't need a medical, let's talk about a little bit of risk management. Um, we there is going to be a later section we're going to talk about that's uh, uh, aerospace uh, medical stuff, which that's a whole different lecture. But today we hit the the, the initial law stuff that they want you to know. Uh, and so for the risk management, um, this is the checklist I use when I'm driving up to the airport, or my uh, it's the I'm safe, you know. And when you're sitting there with the examiner and that right in the off the bat he asked you about you know if he asked you like how do you how do you evaluate yourself you know that you're you know you're safe or how do you evaluate risk i actually on my uh commercial license when i went for my commercial license i wrote the word paved down on a piece of paper and i'd always draw or write a lot of my acronyms for the examiner. So you can do that. You can, I mean, you can help walk yourself through that day because it's kind of a stressful day. You got this guy from the FAA there examining how you think. He wants you to succeed. He looks at you with a mean eye, but he wants you to succeed, right? And, um, but you can write this stuff down and that'll impress him and it'll help you get through it, right? And so that I'm safe, right? So you sit there and you think, all right, illness, right? Am I ill today? No, no. Uh, did I have any medication that would make me drowsy today or make me not make good critical decisions? No. Am I stressed out? Nah, eh, we all carry a certain amount of stress, um, but it's low stress today. Alcohol, some of you aren't even old enough to, in here yet to drink it. We'll talk about alcohol in a second. Um, fatigue, am I fatigued today? Oh, no, I've got a pretty good night's rest. Um, e, uh, some people use eating. Some people use emotion. Uh, I think 
I think Ian, I think you one time used the word energy. I like that. So I stuck that in there. Um, you know, how, how you doing on that level? Did you have at least a little, little breakfast? And if you pass all those, Hey, you passed your health check. You, you passed yourself. I'm self. I'm ready to go flying. Then it's on to your plane checklist, right? Like, is it, you know, how's the glider doing? Is the tires aired up and the wings are tied on? Right. So, so there we go. And that's what you're going to say to him. You're going to, you may, you may have a different one, right? This is not the one you have to use, but this is an industry standard. And people say, Hey, you safe? Yeah, I'm safe. I walk out the door. My wife is like, Hey, you safe? Yeah, I'm safe. Or she's like, you sure you're safe? Like, you know, we were up to 2 AM last night, you know, with, with, you know, visiting friends or something like, Oh yeah, maybe I won't go out flying as long. Okay. All right. So medical fitness, the alcohol issue, right? So, uh, for those of you that are legally able to drink, uh, within eight hours after the consumption of alcoholic beverages, you can't go flying. Okay. And so then to protect that even further, they have number four there while having an alcohol concentration of 0 0.04 or greater in a blood or bread spe breath specimen. Trust me, this, this probably will show up on your exam, on the written exam. It doesn't come up on this question bank here, but it, I think it will in the, one of the later lectures. Um, be there. Uh, except in emergency, no pilot of a civil aircraft may allow a person who appears to be intoxic intoxicated or who demonstrates by banner or physical indications that individual is under the influence of drugs. Um, I did hear of someone one time getting asked, hey, your buddy had was was buzzing you know would you would any really let's go for a flight would you take him and and uh you know he was trying to just see if he was like new like yeah no i can't do that one of the fars said i can't he didn't say 91 17 says i can't do that but okay good yeah all right so um question yes that's that is generally, as I know it, for uh, um, the the ATP guys. Um, I don't know. Not being a military person, I don't know what that rule is. Um, I've heard all kinds of stories. Um, yeah, I. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's. I'm, I'm, I know for a lot of the the uh, the AT, you know, the the big airliners, it's a 12-hour rule. Um, and then I have heard of 24 hour rules. Um, area of opera. Well, you know, but real quick, that does make me think like, you know, if, you know, you really had a bender of a night and it was eight out and eight hours passed, you still may not be good, which is why they also talk about the other. The other level so something to think about in your i'm safe yeah yeah for sure for sure um and definitely most people when they have a hangover are in some pretty interesting emotional states um Yeah. Area of operation. Next one. Pilot logbook or flight records. Um, you know, actually through today was going through this. I was like, oh, there, there may be people that actually just don't even know what a logbook looks like. So this is the SAA logbook um, that we use. And down here, um, you would record your flight times and where and your instructor signs it and um, which plane you flew it in and and all that stuff. Um, you find you finally got yours for Christmas. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Oh, all right. No, um, the glide. If, if you're doing soaring, the glider logbook is um, much cleaner for it. If you just have like a a pow a private power single, like you can still use it. You just kind of got to draw a bunch of different lines here and there and fill in some categories. But if you have a, if you already have a, a power one, we can make it work. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, flight review. There will be there will be several questions on this, um, and this is really this is really here we go. We get into pilot CEs, um, con continuing education credits, right? So um, a flight review con will consist of a minimum of one hour of flight training and one hour one hour of ground training. A minimum, okay. Um, so what this is basically this this whole uh, FAR is about is every two years um, or every 24 calendar months you have to get um, some uh, recurrent training um, and they call it they used to call it a lot of people you'll hear say a BFR they used to call it a biannual flight review the FAA is moving more to this we want you to always be continuing continuously training um, so um, so that's why they got rid of that word biannual flight review and they um, they are trying to encourage you to always think of yourself as training and learning. Um, and uh, so this review should have a review of the current general operating and flight rules of part 91 of this chapter. And they put out a um, an AC on, uh, on this. Uh, these are circulars that kind of like guidance documents from the AIM that um, further explain what they want for these things. And that helps the the person giving you the flight review um, ideas of what should be covered. And and like, again, a minimum. Um, so if you're a glider pilot and you haven't flown in 15 years and it's like, oh, I'm going to go get my one hour of ground and one hour of, of flight and I'm going to be safe again. That flight instructor is probably not going to sign you off. He's probably going to make you fly for a few more hours. Um, and um, the um, OK, so moving on, what else does it want you to have? Um, oh, so a glider pilot may substitute a minimum of three instructional flights in a, gli in a glider, each of which includes a flight to traffic pattern altitude in lieu of the one hour of flight training required in paragraph A of the section. Let's say it's a, what, what that's saying is like, if it's a day where there's not a lot of wind and you can't just, you can't stay up in an hour, how are you gonna get the hour, right? Um, so you could just do three pattern toes or you could do um, to get the, the glider ride. I did a, a flight review with uh, one of our pilots, um, toward the end of the season and we had some great bombastic flight days and w we were up there for like 90 minutes and he's like oh well i guess we better just head back and get our other two passes i'm like no we're over now i mean we're up here 90 minutes your flight review is done we've done all the maneuvers we've talked we've you know so um everybody get that sometimes they may ask you that as a question or you may see that as a, as an option um ways to get out of a flight review what this goes on to say is that um on section d here if uh let's say you get your private pilot in uh january of this coming year or you got it this whatever this year and then next year you add on your commercial um so that ex re-extends your flight review two years so anytime you get any kind of rating, that that obviously counts as a flight review because you were doing lots of training, right? So you you're increasing your your knowledge base, and um, and that also counts if you get a, a flight instructor rating. Um, and then they have this section E down here: a person who has within the period specified in paragraph C 
which you'd have to jump back and read that. This section sat satisfactorily accomplished one or more phases of an FAA sponsored pilot proficiency award program need not accomplish the flight review required by this section. So what the FAA has done is cr created this really cool program called the WINGS program. It's called Fa uh, it's a FAST FAA safety team. I'm actually a, a FAST member um, where they they put on seminars or le one hour lectures. It's one a one hour CE you can go to. And if you go to three of those and complete a phase, then that can count as the hour the ground portion um, for your for your flight review. And you don't have to pay an instructor for an hour of ground, I guess, you know, so um, but they're very cool. Um, I've been to some very cool wings classes. Um, any questions about the pilot? Yeah, they call them they call them wings credits. Yeah, yep, wings credits from the FAA. Um, you can if, you can go up and you can go on the line. Maybe I was trying to see some things that some of these subsidiary things have been furloughed. Um, like I was trying to go see some SKU T weather charts and 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 they're they're taken off right now. And it's like I love SKU T charts and I'm like ah. All right, Congress, get it figured out. I don't care who's right. I just want my skew tees back. Okay, so, um, all right. So the, here's the question. If a recreational or private pilot had a flight review on August 8th this year, when is the next flight review required? August 8th, two years later. August 31 next year. August 31, two years later. Correct. Go, it always goes to the end of the month. Tricky question, right? Like on the big scheme of things, does that make you a better pilot? Well, I guess it might, you know, if you didn't get your flight review in by that a certain date, you might get in trouble. Absolutely. It does. Nope. It does say. Sorry, section C part two there, a logbook endorsed from an authorized instructor who gave the review certifying that the person has satisfactorily completed the review. So, yep. And you don't have your logbook on you. They write it on a scratch of paper and you take it to the back of your logbook and you staple it. <laughs> you know. Um, pilot logbook or flight records. Recent flight experience, pilot in command, 6157. You'll definitely be asked about this on by the examiner or and questions on the written. It says, except as provided in paragraphs, let me skip that. No person may act as a pilot in command of an aircraft carrying passengers or of an aircraft certified for more than one pilot flight crew member unless the person has made at least three takeoffs and three landings within preceding 90 days. Basically, you haven't, it's the soaring season, it's this coming spring, and then you go to Europe for three months on vacation, you come back, you haven't flown in 90 days. Before you go take any passenger up, you need to jump in the front seat and do at least three landings in your glider before you take anybody for a ride. That's called recency, right? Um, and so then what the examiner will say is, well, how current are you? Like, how, how comfortable are you feeling? You just did these three takeoff and landings, but the wind's blowing like 25, like, and you haven't flown for 90 days. Are you really comfortable blowing, flying in that type of conditions, right? So there's always this cons discussion they'll want to get in with, yeah, you're legally recent flight of experience, but like, are you truly competent at that point, right? So they'll have that discussion with you. Um, Exactly. Exactly. Part of that. So that would be, you know, when, when we when I talked about that pave and uh, so you've got the pilot, you got the aircraft, you got the environment and then you got the external factors. Like, why am I doing this? Like, you know, like, you know, your your cousins in town and you really want to take her on a glider flight and you both got back from Europe together and it's blowing like crazy today. And it's like, oh, but there's a storm coming in an hour and I should fly. And it's like, 
so these external pressures of like right now is my time to fly but just wait till tomorrow like do i really have to do are we doing god's work here are we like stopping hitler from crossing the line right like are we really like can it just wait till tomorrow right so there's sometimes you just have to really put the brakes on with flying since it's a fun work and be like you know do you know are we stopping north korea from going in the, you know like right so um that's you know those are the things i always talk with my f-35 pilot buddies that i dream that oh why why didn't i discover aviation when i was a kid instead of drugs i'm a pharmacist so i'm allowed to say that right okay anyway um so to act as pilot in command of an aircraft carrying passengers the pilot must have made at least three takeoffs and three landings in an aircraft of the same category class and if a type rating is required of the same type within the preceding 90 days, 12 calendar months, 24 calendar months. Okay. So what, what this stop, right? 90 days. What, um, I'm glad we read this question because so in the, in the, in the, in the attempt for the FAA to be efficient, some of these questions, you read this, you, you see these words, category, class, and they're talking and type, right? Like, 747 is a type of airplane right like if you're an if you're a commercial airliner pilot like you you go through special training just to fly that type of aircraft well they use all these words because some of the people taking these tests are going for their private pilot and and uh, power and so they try to use a lot of these same questions out of efficiency they don't change them so you will notice in the study bank some questions that don't really apply to us but they make you take them anyway because it kind of covers your area right and um um and you'll you'll see that in some of the other areas and some of that we'll talk about and some of that i'll have to be like you're just gonna have to like memorize and grin and bear it okay um just to get through it okay so and when we come to those you'll know what they are like there could be vor questions on your thing and a vor is a a, a this fm transmitter radio thing that i suppose a glider could have in it but um we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there Yes, a glider. Well, so so we we typically don't fly nighttime gliding here with Hood River Soaring because none of our gliders have lights or anything. But at Oshkosh and some air shows, they do some nighttime glider stuff. So those guys would have to stay current and do three nighttime landings to a full stop. Are they carrying passengers? I doubt it. You know. It's and unless there's people in there helping because some of those some of those so some of these gliders at these air shows they are they're like launching fireworks and stuff i've never looked in to see if like is there a second guy in there helping set off the pyrotechnics or is that all done by like a ground crew and radio i i don't know that's that uh, i haven't looked into that but um but yeah that's definitely that question could be on your exam right so i'm glad you brought that up Correct. Correct. And so here, this is where I just get a little bit into that. In the far section of 1.1, it's all the definitions the FAA gets into. So I just pulled these out, uh, which actually happen to be the very first ones. Category, and I put I put the people as you as a pilot what you get as a license in red so the category as used with respect to the certifications of ratings privileges and limitations of airmen it's not excluding you mo airmen uh, means a broad classification of aircraft examples include that you can fly an airplane you could fly a rotorcraft you could fly a glider blah blah blah, blah right but for aircraft that would mean this aircraft is a transport aircraft or this is a 
the category calls it a normal aircraft or utility or acrobatic, right? So um, a lot of Pawnees that tow gliders sometimes could come with limited or restricted um, category ratings, which sometimes could present a problem. But it, outside of the scope of this class and then the class of it, uh, the airman is like so if you have a single engine or a multi multi engine um, well gliders actually we have motor gliders and you don't have to have a power license to fly them it's a total loophole so you could you could not have a medical which is generally going to be required for a lot of the power stuff and and you got this power, this motorized glider, right? So it's, it, I find that a fascinating loophole. Um, okay, so any questions about this? This is kind of more like you just wrote, it's, it somewhat makes sense, but there will be questions. So with respect to the certification of aircraft, which is a class of aircraft? Airplane, rotorcraft, glider, balloon, normal, utility, Acrobatic limited or transport restricted provisional? Which one? Airplane, rotorcraft, glider, balloon. So that's it's just one you got to just kind of kind of got to learn. Does it? Did that make sense? Okay. Yeah. 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 I. You know, it's it's easy to kind of get mixed up. Okay. So, um, here we are, like at. 802 and we're uh getting ready to hit kind of like the the maintenance section we're a little over halfway through do you want to take a quick five minute break stretch your legs okay cool okay back to the second part of this um air airworthiness uh and registration certificates operating limitations and weight and balance uh, data and equipment list so this is typically referred to as aero uh, aro um, and, and so here you can see i've written that out uh, aero airworthiness certificate registration certificate operating limitations weight and balance so um, just quickly an airworthiness certificate is merely just a uh, document that was issued by the FAA that says this plane is airworthy and um, as long as that airplane ma is maintained in the condition um, that it was first produced that airworthiness certificate is always good um, and then the registration certificate that's a, a re registration um, to who the who it's registered due to, to the owner and um, the state of Oregon used to also make you register, have an airplane registration with the state, but they actually took that away recently. Oh, it, it does. Okay. All right. I stand corrected for anybody in Oregon. Right. Okay. Oh. Right, right. So what we're talking about, like this whole section, aero section, is what does the plane need for for paperwork? Yeah. So, yeah. So, airworthiness certificate for the airplane, registration certificate to the feds and to the state. Um, operating limitations. Um, so, these comes in many different forms. Um, they come in the form of uh, an actual uh, operating book for the plane, um, and if it 
existed before an operating book was actually written for your plane, then it's placards or markings that are just written on the plane. Um, they can be as nice as some restorers actually pounding in a nice piece of metal to um, those little guns where you turn the letters and you crank them out and you say, you know, and it says, you know, what the instrument is um, or what the weight limit is um, and uh, or just the colors uh, on the the instrument itself, such as the airspeed indicator will have like greens and yellows and whites and reds. And we'll learn about that. Um, and then the weight and balance of the plane. Um, are you in within CG limits so that the plane flies safely? Um, question. Um, the, I think they all do. I'm not sure. We have an antique glider called a K8. I'm not sure if it has a POH. Um, um, ha, are you? Have you joined the club yet? So when you join the club, you'll get access to the behind the scenes website, and that has all the POHs for all the gliders. Now, if we do any work with weight and balance in this class, I'll supply all that for you. Oh, sorry, pilot operating handbook. Yes, yes. I'll never be afraid to ask a question, right? Um, okay. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm so light for some of our gliders that I have to add um, a ballast or like on takeoff, it, it could like porpoise so bad that, you know, and we had one examiner actually said that he's twice seen somebody in a, a training glider be killed by not adding the ballast. So we're always very cautious about adding ballast, especially little people like me and Ian and Gideon and um, making sure that there's ballast in there. Doug, you are little, but I, I, think, I think you got the weight. Um, okay, so civil aircraft certifications required. Um, so this is where this is saying, uh, no person may operate a civil aircraft unless it has within it an appropriate and current airworthiness certificate, an effective, and it goes on, um, an effective U.S. registration certificate issued to its owner or for the operation within the United States. Um, and they must be displayed at the cabin or, cabin or cockpit entrance so that it is legible to passengers or crew. Um, and so we do our best. Um, I think the little small GA airplanes are, you know, they'll be like hidden, like they're, they're displayed, but they're like, they're, they're, you know, like down by the legs, you know, like it's just hard, you know, like and a lot of times on the glider, it's behind right here behind the uh, instructor's head in the training glider, because that's the only flat spot that we can display it. Um, but they are displayed. And there will be questions about this. Okay, moving on. The second part of this, 91.9, Civil Aircraft Flight Manual Marking and Placard Requirements. No person may operate a civil aircraft without complying with the operating limitations specified in the approved airplane or rotorcraft flight manual markings and placards. Okay, or no person may oper operate a U.S. registered civil aircraft unless there is available in the aircraft a current approved airplane uh, manual or for which an airplane or rotorcraft flight manual is not required by 21.5 unless there is available in the aircraft a current approved manual material, markings and placards, blah, 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 right? So again, what they're saying here is that, oh, actually, this is an important one, 21.5, it's up until 1979, there was no standard to like what would be in these. And then at that point, the government said, you know, there's going to be these eight sections and they've got this section has to have this and this section has to have the structure and this structure, this section has to have all these things. And so after that, you can find, you know, the POHs or, or, or the flight manuals are all have similar sections prior to that as long as there's some type of placard in it saying you know if the pilot's 120 pounds to 400 
you're good, right? I mean, that that's legal. That's like a, you know, so that counts. So that's where this section is. Questions? It's not as difficult as it looks. So here's here's how hard the questions get. Where may where may an aircraft's operating limitations be found? A on the airworthiness certificate. B in the current FAA approved flight manual, approved manual material markings and placards, or any combination thereof. C in the aircraft airframe and engine log books. B, good job. And then it even says 919. So that's about as hard as the questions get. Okay. All right. Maintenance requirements, appropriate records, airworthiness directives, and compliance records. This stuff's kind of fun. Okay. So, general, the owner or operator of an aircraft is primarily responsible for maintaining that aircraft in an airworthy condition. Our soaring club is the owner and operator of nearly all of our six planes. Um, we lease a couple. <clears throat> and so we are most for the ones we own are in charge of that. Um, no person may perform maintenance, preventative maintenance or alterations on an aircraft other than is prescribed in this subpart and other applicable regulations, including part 43. Again, way at the beginning, remember I said 43 is the maintenance section. Okay. Moving down here to 91.405, maintenance required. Each owner or operator of an aircraft sh shall have in. So th here's a section that you could get asked about or it could show up on a question that basically talks about if you have an inoperative instrument in your airplane, it has to be marked inoperative. Okay. In short, that's what this says. This one's kind of a little thick. Correct, correct. As long as, correct. Um, when you get into like the big airline stuff or commercial flying, they have what they call MELs, minimum equipment list, right? And like you're a pilot, you you know, your your flight today is from Portland to Chicago and you jump in this 737 because that's what you're type rated for. You're flying 737s all the day and you, Oh no, my what you calls failed. You open up your MEL. You're allowed to fly this plane when the what you call it fails on flights shorter than 4,000 miles. Great. Okay, I can fly this from Portland to Chicago, right? So that's what MELs do. Gliders, we don't really have MELs. Now, the one thing we can get, what I could start to say here is if you wanted to start to do wave soaring where you're going to start busting into 18,000 feet and you need to have a transponder working to do that. If that glider, you, your, the club uses to do that is failed, you know, we would put in op and you as an operator is like, oh, well, I'm not gonna take this to 18,000 feet today because I have to have that, okay? But you could fly it lower than that, okay? So that's, that's where those rules come into play. Here's a question that starts to address some of this stuff. Who is responsible for ensuring airworthiness directives are complied with? Owner or operator, the repair station, or the mechanic with the inspection authorization that repaired your plane, let's say. So who is that? A. So without even knowing what an airworthiness directive is, you're like, yep, it's the owner or operator. So an airworthiness directive is a bulletin put out by the FAA um, let's take and point the, uh, the, uh, the, Bol the Bolonics, uh, which there's a, there's a Bolonic that's a, a, a good two person sailplane. I think Ben, the, Bol uh, no, not that one. It's a different one. Um, that is a fully acrobatic plane, except you can't do rolls in it. You can do loops, everything else, all the other acrobatic, but you can't do the rolls in it. And um, there's an AD against it. Wings were breaking off or something. Okay, so so there's an AD that the the owner or operator is responsible for it, right? And it has an AD against the plane, but you can still fly it. You just can't go do rolls in it.
Um, that might have been. It might have been. I don't remember. I, it's been a while since I discussed the AD. Um, and we don't have one of those, so that didn't. Ninety-one four zero seven operation after maintenance, preventative maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration. Um, so, this subject, this one's really covering. Um, well, what it's really covering. Okay, so we'll read it. No person may operate any aircraft that has undergone maintenance, preventative maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration unless one, it's been approved and returned to service by a, a person authorized. So your your uh, a and p or your ia so a and p is a guy that's a mechanic that's we call them airframe power plant mechanics and an ia is a higher level of ia uh who's basically takes a lot of a liability and says yes this work is done correct and you can go fly it okay so um they're really smart guys and um in part b no person may carry in this is the important part of this no person may carry any person other than crew members in an aircraft that has been maintained rebuilt or altered in a manner that may have appreciably changed its flight characteristics or substantially affected its operation and flight until an appropriate an appropriately rated pilot with at least a private pilot certificate flies the aircraft makes an operational check of it the maintenance performed or alteration made and logs the flight in the aircraft records. So you as a private pilot, after you make some major change or fix to a plane, could be the test pilot that takes it up and makes sure it's safe. Um, here's the question. If an alteration or repair substantially affects an aircraft's operation and flight, that aircraft must be test flown by an appropriately rated pilot and approved for return to service prior to be operated by A, a pri any private pilot, B, with passengers aboard, C, for compensation or higher. All right. Oh, B. So here's where we just weren't listening, right? So it's saying that If an alteration or repair substantially affects an aircraft's operation flight, that aircraft must be test flown by an appropriately rated pilot and approved for return to service prior to being operated with passengers aboard. Right. Yeah, one that doesn't carry passengers. So, um, right. Okay. Inspections. Um, what's important here is that um, every year, no person may operate an aircraft unless within the preceding 12 calendar months it has had an annual inspection in accordance with Part 43 of this chapter and has been approved for return to service by a person. Okay, so we call them annuals. Um, our, our gliders get done annual. They go through everything um, every year. Like you have to review any of those 80s, airworthiness directives is what they're called. And uh, some 80s are annually, some 80s may be done by hours and things like that. But each annual, your IA will review, okay, what needs to be done to this glider and what needs to be looked at that needs to be you know, uh, made sure safe or some things need to be changed out each time, right? Um, and then those need to be entered into the required maintenance records. Now, for our planes, since we train in them, no person may operate section part or part B here, no person may operate an aircraft carrying any person other than a crew member for hire. No person may give flight instruction for hire in an aircraft which that person provides unless within the preceding 100 hours of time and service, the aircraft has received an annual or 100 hour inspection. So every 100 hours of use, the glider or a, an airplane needs to be looked at if that's 
being used for training. Okay. An aircraft's annual condition inspection was performed on July 12th this year. The next annual inspection will be due no later than July 1 next year, July 13 next year, July 31st next year. Yep, okay. All right, we're almost to the end here. ATC transponder tests and inspections. I was talking about transponders earlier. Some of you may say, hey, what's a transponder, right? So a transponder is basically a device that a ATC can see you, right? They ping out a signal, and if you're at five, if you're at twelve thousand feet in the air uh, over Mount Hood, that radar collects that signal, brings it back, says, "Hey, there's where you are." And for our gliders that like to go up high and get around Mount Hood and take a look. There's a lot of 737s coming into Portland on the Hood 3 arrival. That's an arrival path called the Hood 3 arrival that they fly. It's like I-84, Hood 3 arrival flies uh, right. They come right by us generally around mm, at, at that over Hood River here. They're around 8,500. Um, Given scenics, I've made them detour a little bit here and there. Um, kind of fun. Um, but um, they can see us too. They have things in their nose of their cones that pings off our transponders. So that's why it's important for some of our gliders to have these transponders, right? And it says we, we can't use it unless every 24 hours it's been tested. I'm sorry. Sorry, 24 months. Yes, 24 hours. Jeez, this is expensive business. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Make sure you guys are paying attention. Um, all right, so maintenance records show the last transponder inspection was performed on September 1, 2014. The next inspection will be due no later than September 30th, 2015, September 1st, 2016, September 30th, 2016. See, all right, good job. Okay, maintenance records. Um, this is basically saying that each maintenance record, uh, that that the owner operator has to keep the records and any time that um, any maintenance or preventative maintenance has been done, that a description of the work, the date of the work, and the signature and certificate number of the person that did it. So if you as a private pilot change the tire, you wrote, change the tire in the logbook, brand new tire, you wrote your name, you sign it, your certificate number, okay? So preventative maintenance has been performed on an aircraft. What paperwork is required? A, full detailed description of the work done must be entered in the airframe logbook. The date the work was completed and the name of the person who did the work must be entered in the airframe and engine logbook. C, the signature, certificate number, and kind of certificate held by the person that approved the work and a description of the work must be entered in the aircraft maintenance records. C, there were, that one was a little trickier, huh? It's also getting a little late, okay. Persons authorized to approve return to service. A person holding at least a private pilot may approve an aircraft for return to service after performing, performing preventive maintenance. This is in 43.7. Who may perform preventive maintenance on an aircraft and approve it for return to service? Student or recreational pilot, private or commercial pilot, none of the above. B. Good job. Okay, this is the last one, I think. Maintenance requirements. Okay, this is Appendix A of Section 43. This is the appendix that says, what can I change as, or what can I work on as preventative maintenance? This is the appendix to 43. Remember, part 43 is the maintenance section. Preventative maintenance is limited to the following work provided it does not involve complex assembly operations. 
removal, installation, and repair of landing gear tires, replacing electric elastic shock absorber cords on landing gear, servicing landing gear shock struts by adding oil, air, or both, servicing landing gear wheel bearings such as cleaning and greasing, replacing defective safety wiring or cotter keys, lubrication not requiring disassembly other than removal of non-structural items such as cover plates, cowlings, and fairings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I kind of mentioned the main ones because I've heard a lot of these asked by examiners. Okay, so oh, one question here, which operation would be described as preventative maintenance, re replenishing hydraulic fluid, repair of portions of skin sheets by making additional seams, repair of landing gear brace struts? Hey, good job. Okay, so we're out of that maintenance section. Uh, just kind of setting you up for your whole piloting career here, which hits section 91, which are the rules of general aviation, right? Responsibility and authority of the pilot in command, it all starts with you. Um, the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. The other important statement here is in an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, the pilot in command may deviate from any rule of this part to the extent required to meet that emergency. Okay, so if you have to fly through some restricted airspace to get down because the passenger behind you is having a heart attack, you dive down through the restricted airspace, right? Um, in the 91.7 Civil Aircraft Airworthiness, no person may operate a civil aircraft unless it is, an, is in an airworthy condition. The pilot in command of a civil aircraft is responsible for determining whether that aircraft is in condition for safe flight. The pilot in command shall discontinue the flight when unairworthy mechanical, electrical, or structural conditions occur. So what, what, what this discussion brings up with an examiner is yes the owner and operator is responsible for for making you know sure that the plane is maintained correctly and the logbook entries are put out and everything but you as a pilot that goes to fly it has to ensure that they've done that right so even as just a student pilot if you're on the field and something doesn't look right you know and I'm out there with you saying, oh, come on, let's get this flight going or whatever, you know, which there's, I don't believe in emergency takeoff. So there's no reason I'll ever really be hurrying you. There could be an emergency landing for a reason, right? You as a student pilot speak up like, is that right? You know, should that aileron be hanging off the wing like that? Are we going to be okay? You know, I mean, so, so that's just a little bit of, I don't know, knowledge to keep you alive. Um, so here's the question. Who is responsible for determining if an aircraft is in condition for safe flight? A certified aircraft mechanic? Sure he is. The pilot in command? The owner or operator? So it falls with you. And so you, that discussion will come up in your check ride. Okay. Um, so here's my little... I was trying to find a glider doing sky riding, but couldn't find one. So anyway, so any questions, concerns, thoughts? Thank you for this joining this. Like I said, this is the toughest one, the regulations. Um, and the next time we meet, no class next week because I'm going to be doing aerobatics. Um, but the next time we meet, we're going to dive into the wonderful phenomena of weather, which we get to fly in, which you're going to really enjoy soaring here in the Hood River Valley. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Yes. I, I, yeah, I can, uh, yeah, I'll post it on the website. Yeah, I'll post it on the website. And, um, and then, like I said, the presentation too will be there, but obviously, um, oh, the, uh, Hood River Soaring website. And when it gets up, I will notify you. 